Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and we're once again recording at Nutmeg Post with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an actor, director, and singer who's appeared in dozens of movies and TV shows, including Ed TV, the great Buck Howard, Crazy Mama, Glee, Star Trek, Voyager, Family Guy, Murder, She Wrote, Yes, Dear, Mad TV, Fantasy Island, and The Love Boat, just to name a few. He's also directed feature films, including The Last Best Sunday and Moolah, starring Treat Williams and Shalene Woodley. In his five decade career. He's worked with everyone from Angela Lansbury to Cloris Leachman to John Malkovich to former amazing colossal podcast guest Dick Van Dyke, Larry Storch, and Eliana Douglas. But to generations of TV viewers, he's best known as the girl chasing practical joker Ralph Mouth on the much-loved situation comedy Happy Days. These days, you could find him dividing his time between acting gigs and leading a seven-piece orchestra in his live musical review, Donnie Moe Sings and Swings, in which he covers the songbooks of Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, and his beloved Bobby Darren. Please welcome to the show a man who reportedly memorized the entire script of The Jolson Story. The pride of Erasmus High School and our fellow Brooklynite, Don Most. Hello, that was quite an introduction. Boy, I'm, I, you had me riveted. <laughs> <laughs> it is a little like this is your life, Don. Yeah, it really is. Now, now you'll have to excuse me if I'm, at times I'll start calling you Donnie after <laughs> That's all you've right. been known as Donnie most that, all these it's, years. It's true. I've, I've had several identity crises in my life. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was when I started in the business. Uh, I mean, I started pursuing it when I was about thirteen, and 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 all my friends called me Donnie. My real name was Donald, um, but Donnie was what I went by, and it, everyone said, "Hey, that's a great stage name, Donnie Most." You know, so um, that's how I how I went and to, up until Happy Days, and then uh, through Happy Days, of course. But then um, when I when I was leaving, I left the show after the seventh season. My contract was up, and and, you know, I felt like, okay, I have to sort of, now I'm an adult and I have to make the break away from that, that, you know, as an actor, you want to go on beyond one character. So um, I thought now I needed to move into Don most. So that's, that's, that's where that, that's where that, ha- it, the transition is, was. Is this like how uh, Debbie Gibson became Deborah Gibson at one point? <laughs> I, I imagine so. Um, I imagine, um, but it's the funny thing is that when I decided to do the music that I'm doing, and I started to appear, um, it didn't feel right lifting myself as Don. So I kind of went back to Donnie for the music. It's 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 weird. I don't know why. So for films and stuff, I'd like to go as Don. For music, I want to go uh, alive as Donnie. But although although on my newest on my CD that I'm working on. Um, I've been uh, talked into by a friend of mine who's a record guy into going with Demost for <laughs> Demost. Demost, I right. like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hip hop. Yeah, yeah, Demost. So, so I think that, so. The name of the CD is going to be Demost, mostly swinging. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's now, got a good now sound. Frank, Frank, and I want you to recite some lines of dialogue <laughs> from the or jo- whole pieces <laughs> from the of dramatic dialogue from the Jolson Is that story. bullshit, Don? Because you do research on somebody yeah. and you find things that you don't, you don't know if there's any truth to them. But I know you've, you've, you've got a fondness for that movie. Well, at, at one time, I probably did know 
just about the entire uh, script of the film. Uh, I, I'd be hard pressed to repeat any of it right now because it's been so long <laughs> since I've seen it. But I, I see when I was nine years old, I um, you know New York as well. Gilbert, you would remember, I guess, a million dollar movie. Which yeah. Was, oh, sure. I was yeah. on. W-O-R. We talk about that on the show a lot. Yeah. So I I, I remember I came I went to school. Uh, I was in third grade. I was nine years old, and a friend of mine said, "Oh, did you see the movie Million Dollar Movie last night? It was the, the Jolson story." And I said, no, you know, I knew nothing about it. And he said, oh, it was really good. So I went home that night, it was probably Tuesday, and watched it. And it was like transforming to me, cause seeing Jolson. And, and for some reason, it had a major impact on me. So I watched it every night the rest of the week. And then it would be on four times Saturday and four <laughs> times Sunday. And I watched all of it. So, and, the, and then when it came on the next year, this, so I must have seen the movie like, you know, 50 times. So, I, so by osmosis, I, I was able to memorize it. But like I said, I don't know it too much right now. I wish I did. I remember me and my sisters growing up would do the same thing. We'd pick out a movie yeah. and watch it constantly because yeah. it would keep rerunning. Well, there were yeah. four channels. Yeah, so there were yeah very exactly. Much fewer choices. Yeah, so if you like something, why not? You know, we didn't have DVR and, or, you know, video cassettes. <laughs> Now, more importantly than the Jolson story, yes, a movie I like even more is Jolson Sings, Sings Again. again. <laughs> yes. Were they both Larry Park? Yes. Yes, yes yeah. they were. Yes. They Where were. They, they introduce Larry Parks as Jolson to the actor who will play him in the Jolson story. Yeah, yeah, that was a... So Larry Parks as Jolson meets Larry Parks as Larry Parks. <laughs> as Larry Spooky. Parks. I know, that was a little <laughs> surreal. It was like a little <laughs> Twilight Zone episode or something. <laughs> <laughs> We're all Brooklyn kids, Don, and you bring up the, the Million Dollar Movie. I mean, just briefly, what else did you watch? Oh, gosh. Well, it, um, I watched, I loved a lot of the sitcoms. I was a huge, uh, in comedy, I was a big fan of Abbott and Costello. I loved, uh-huh. oh, yes. I, I loved watching them because uh, they had a TV show on. Um, sure. And, 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 you know, I was a big Dick fan. I used to watch the Dick Van Dyke show, and, and I was a huge Twilight Zone fan. I, 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 I was into that big time. And I loved a lot of the old movies, um, in, uh, old W.C. Fields movies I loved. He was, mm-hmm. I was a big fan of his. And um, I'm trying to think on the comedy side, you know, Jack Benny. And, and, and then I watched a lot of the variety shows, too. I, I enjoyed we all watched Ed Sullivan every Sunday night. But uh, shows like the Craft Music Hall and, and I remember stuff like that where I watched uh, where I got to became a, a huge fan of Darren, Bobby Darren. I saw him on that a bunch of times and that got me hooked on him. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Here's those Abbott and Costello movies used to be on Sundays. Yeah. Remember? Oh, yeah. They, yeah. they would run them in rotation. They would have the movies, and then the TV show. I love the TV show because yeah. uh, Sid Fields, Sid the Fields. landlord, <laughs> yeah, landlord oh, yeah. right. would, uh, would call them boys, boys, <laughs> and, and they were like in their 60s. Yes. He, would also, <laughs> he would also abuse them <laughs> yeah. in oh, yeah. various he ways. He would smack, smack them, them around. around. Yeah, he'd smack, yeah. Yeah. Well, and he'd I smack them. Ca- uh, Costello around. And yeah. I remember the music was da 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 Oh, right. da 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 That's right. I forgot that song. Yeah, with Bacha Galoop. Oh, yes. Bacha Galoop. And I remember, oh, God. Joe Besser. Joe Besser. Oh, yeah. As Stinky. As Stinky, right. He used to scare me as a kid. <laughs> like, like, I don't know. A Nance comic, as Orson Bean explained yeah, uh, to us. Yes, yes. yes. He, he scared, scared you, me. much like a cl- some people afraid of clowns, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> And and, then, to, and there was that great ahead. routine, and Sid Fields did that, I think, in the movie, and, you know, the slowly I turn, step by oh, step. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You remember that, that great routine? That goes back routine? to vaudeville. Yeah, the old vaudeville routine, right. That's where they started. What's yeah. the other one, too, where he proves that the, 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 the oh. loaf of bread is the mother of an airplane? Oh. Necessity <laughs> is the mother of invention? But, well, and then, of course, the classic who's on first. I mean, yes. that, was unbe- oh, yeah. that was unbelievable. Somebody, somebody told us, who did we have on the show? Is Orson Bean or Peter, Mar- Peter Marshall we had on the show? Somebody told Told us that Phil Silvers did "Who's on First First? Really? Before which we didn't know either. Oh wow! I th- I think there were about a 
thousand different comedians back then doing a variation on who's on first. Oh, I always thought that uh, Cost- Evan Costello created that. That's interesting. They I popularized it. Yeah. And they're in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah. Oh, as, yeah. As a result of that. Yeah. I saw that when I went to the Cooperstown. I saw them. Yeah. Cool. So you went to Erasmus High. Yeah. Which, according to my research, uh, also was the uh, 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 high school <laughs> attended by, you'll love this, Gil, not only popularly uh, Neil Diamond and Barbara Streisand, but Eli Wallach. Yes, Eli oh! Wallach. And, and, and Mo Howard. Oh, I didn't know Mo Howard went there. That's according to, I, now according I, to what I found. I didn't even think Mo Howard went as far as high well, school. Well, it could be bullshit, as yeah. I say. <laughs> <laughs> We're trusting the internet. Joe yeah. Barbera, also from Hanna Barbera, according oh. to what according oh. to what I found. And, and and Barbara Stanwyck. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Didn't wow, that. that's good stuff. Barbara Stanwyck. Now Barbara Stanwyck's a lesbian, isn't she? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't have any uh, firsthand, no, you know, any knowledge or anything. Uh, but she's. It, <laughs> but, she's supposed to be uh, a very nice woman, she's according gone. to Linda Evans. Yeah. Oh. Linda Evans said Barbara Stanwyck was a wonderful woman, uh-huh. but I, I say she was a lesbian. Well, well okay, I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> but I have an interesting anecdote about, uh, about Erasmus and Barbara Streisand. Oh, yeah, let's hear it. Um, I mean, this was always what I heard. I, I can't... Uh, vouch for a hundred percent for the, the the accuracy of this, but the the story that we always heard was that she was in the school you know choir and got kicked out. She got kicked off of the the, the choir because her voice wouldn't blend in because it just stood out so much that she got kicked out of the the choir. So that was wow, a cool. I never heard that. That's I, cool. I actually was supposed to attend the Erasmus and I attended it for about maybe. Two, three weeks. Oh, really? What, you move? And then I, I dropped out. Also, his voice wouldn't blend in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that I can understand. I, <laughs> yeah. While I was there, I tried to ask Barbara Stanwyck out on a date. <laughs> oh, cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> and instead you went out with Eli Wallach. Right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Eli Wallach, I found out, is a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> See what you learn on this show, Don? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very informative. Now, um, how did you start? Um, okay, well, what happened, uh, I I was always, after, like, the Jolson story, I was I, I was so into that, and I would be singing Jolson stuff for my grandparents, and, you know, and even at my bar mitzvah, I got up and sang with the band. I did rock by your baby with the Dixie Melody, I remember. <laughs> And um, so everyone was like saying, oh, man, you know, you should do something. And I, so I finally admitted to my parents, you know, because I, I was embarrassed to admit that I wanted to pursue singing and acting. But um, so I, they found me um, a, a school to go to in Manhattan that was run by an old vaudevillian a guy named Charlie Lowe. And then I found out years later, Elliot Gould went to the same school um, and they taught like singing and dancing and acting. I had to learn tap dancing, which I didn't really want, but I was more interested in the singing. But uh, Charlie Lowe ran the school and his wife, Kasha, taught the tap dancing. And then he had a professional group uh, that he would handpick from the school to go and perform um, uh, during the summers up in the Catskill Mountains in the Borscht Belt. So I got picked to be in, in the group in the summer of 68 when I was like turning 15 I performed up in the Catskills singing in the nightclubs with all these other kids about eight of us and we did every sing, you know toured all the hotel all the hotels up there everyone except the Concord we couldn't get into the Concord for whatever reason <laughs> <laughs> that was for the big name talent you know and we weren't up there yet so uh, that's how I kind of got my start um but then uh, after that year, I switched gears and got into a more serious acting class and then met a woman who became my manager. And then I started pursuing the acting side and put music uh, on the back burner for a while for a long time until until a couple of years ago. I'm trying to picture you at 15 singing Jolson songs yeah. to the Catskills. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was so into it. And Eddie Cantor, you know, all that kind of I loved wow. all that stuff. And now... Jumping ahead, when you got the job yeah. on Happy Days, yeah. Anson Williams was known as the singer right, right. on the show. Yes. And, and you wanted to sing, too. Could you tell us that story? Yeah, um, there is a great story there. Um, well, what happened was, you know, I, we started doing the show, what, 73? 
before we went on the air. And uh, this was about five years removed from when I was singing up in the Catskills. And, um, and that what, what I didn't know that Anson had gone to Anson had done musical theater and everything. And he went to Gary Marshall, the creator of happy days um, pretty early on in that first season and, and, and said, Hey, look, you got, you're doing a show about the fifties. You got the drive in, the drive in, you know, uh, restaurant. You got the girls on roller skates, the poodle skirts, the whole ambiance of the fifties. And music was such a big part of it. You need to have the music in there. Why don't you let us form a band? And I, I you know, and I, I do, I'm a singer. And Gary sa- said to him, oh, you're a singer? And are you any good? And Anson's saying, yeah, I think I'm pretty good. So Anson tells a very funny story of how Gary, how Gary introduced Anson singing in the first episode. And it's a, in his new book book called singing to a bulldog in which the one there's a chapter where he explains a story and basically I, I shouldn't spoil it but basically gary says to him okay i'm gonna let you form a band and then he walks away and then he turns and says but you're singing to a bulldog and then and then <laughs> <laughs> and then Nancy goes what he goes you're singing to a bulldog this way if you're if you're not any good, it'll still be funny. And if you're good, it'll still be funny. Either way, I win. So you're singing to a bulldog. <laughs> and that's what he did. He had him, he had him singing. Uh, it was a fraternity. It was a show where we were singing at a fraternity. And as their mascot, they had a bulldog there. So you'll, if you look at that episode, there's Anson singing to a bulldog. But you then approached yeah. Gary. Yeah, I did. I did approach, too. Yeah, well, so what happened was... Uh, you know, several ep- episodes go by, and I'm seeing Anson doing all the singing, and and you know, here I I had a whole background with singing, so I made a I I made an appointment with my manager to go and have a meeting with Gary Marshall. So I, I remember we go in there, and Gary's behind his desk, and I'm pleading this whole case about how I how I was a <laughs> singer back, you know, when I was 15, and and you should let me do some too. You know, we were a band; I could do some, and Anson does some. And and he looks at me, takes a dramatic pause, and he goes, if I was putting on an act and I needed a juggler, I wouldn't need two jugglers. <laughs> Shut you down, huh? Shut yeah. me down pretty quick. So I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't quite know how to react to that, but that was the end of uh, my case. So I, they wound up letting me do um, – there was like a special Valentine's show where everyone did a musical number and I sang in that. And so, but I didn't really get to do, uh, you know, what I would have liked. But the truth of the matter is the music that I really love and what I'm doing now as a singer is not really 50s music. It's the great American songbook and swing and big band jazz and all the jazz standards and stuff like that. Sinatra and Bobby Darren and Dino and Nat King Cole and, and even some more of the blues jump jive and whale kind of stuff you know i love all that so um i'm getting to do i'm doing that now and not only with a seven piece band i just did it at a club out here in la with a 17 piece band and it was smoking it was so much fun it's just a hoot and um i'm 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 getting great response and i'm I'm having a great great time doing it and because like I, i was mentioned i i saw darren bobby at the copa when i was 18 years old back you know when the copa was the place to play in new york and that was an amazing experience, and uh, I actually was trying to get the Bobby Darren movie made way back in 1976. I had Bobby's manager in my camp, and their, uh, the attorney for his estate let me pitch it up at Paramount, and uh, we, I went through three different meetings, but ultimately they passed on it. So I was... I had, um, Kind of mixed feelings, you know, years later when Kevin Spacey was able to get the movie made. And um, on one hand, I was like thrilled that they finally were doing something because I wanted Darren to live on and and I was happy that they were doing it. But it was a bummer that it wasn't me getting to do the movie, you know. Sure. <laughs> that, we were going to ask you about that. That movie's come up on this show. We've oh, talked yeah. about the John Goodman scene where he's, where, oh, he's doing, yes. where he's doing the update. But he was a little old for the – I mean, it's a labor yes. of love, that movie. And his yes. affection for Bobby Darren is moving. But he was a little old for the part. That was the big problem with that movie. He was too old for to that. Put it mildly. Yeah. I mean, he was – you know, I mean, to play him when he was young, uh, he was older than Bobby was when Bobby died. You know? Right. So, um, I, yeah, I, I understand him wanting – you know, be, being passionate about it. And he did some great things, you know. I mean, you've got to give him a lot of credit. But – as a movie, I think that 
kept it from working on the level it could have. Yeah, I brought up that movie a bunch of times on this show because it has – there's always these terrible parts <laughs> in in movies based on real stories especially – where the character has to basically yell to the audience what's going on. <laughs> in biopics. So right. John Goodman is Bobby Darren's manager. Yeah. And, playing and Steve so, Blauner. Steve Blauner, so, that's who right. he's playing. Yes. So Bobby Darren goes, ah, I have no career. I never <laughs> made anything. At, to, at that point, John Goodman, as the manager, has to go, what do you mean, Bobby? You've had 17 hit albums. <laughs> right. You've won five Grammy Awards. Right. You- <laughs> right. Yeah, they're giving the litany of his, uh, his resume. Yeah, and right. it, it takes like about 15 minutes of credit. <laughs> in, in the 30s, they would have done it with spinning headlines oh, of, yes. of That's variety. Right. <laughs> That's right. That would have got it done more efficiently. <laughs> you, met, you met him when you, he was, you said there's a story online that I found. You met him. He was with his son. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dodd. Boy. Is his son still around, by yes. the way? Dodd? Yes, he is. Dodd. Mm-hmm. Boy, you've, I'm impressed with the homework you've done there. That's very... I'm, well, I mm, try. That's great. Um, yeah, what happened was this was before um, I was on Happy Days. I was go, I was uh, pounding the pavement, going on auditions in New York City, and I was... Um, you know, I'd taken the subway from Brooklyn into the city, and uh, I had an interview, and then I heard on the radio... Um, that there was a group that, uh, you know, they, they had the Schaefer music concerts in Central Park every uh, during the summer then. Uh, I don't know what they call them now, but back then they were called the Schaefer music concerts. Schaefer beer? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sponsor? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, uh, and there was a, a rock group of some kind that was supposed to be performing that night. And for some reason they had to drop out last minute. And they said replacing them is, is Bobby. And, and it seemed like an odd choice because it was a rock group. But... Um, but I was excited as hell, so I, I said, I'm in the city, I'm just staying, I'm, and I'm going to go to the concert. So I, I wound up going over to the, to the, to the amphitheater pretty early because I, I had nothing else to do, and I heard music. So what happened was they had been finishing a sound check rehearsal. So I, I got as close as I could, and I'm waiting around. Then all of a sudden I see uh, Bobby walking out from behind the the theater with a young boy and I, I, I'm pretty shy I was pretty shy I still am I always kind of shy and I didn't want to I didn't know what to do but there was no way I could stop myself from approaching him because I was such a huge fan so I walked over to him and introduced myself and and um, and I know I must have sounded like a babbling idiot because I was going on and on about <laughs> I've you know this and, this and and then I said to him I think I've sung Mac the Knife more than you have, you know, and because and, and he looked at me like I was crazy. But the truth of the matter is, I probably sang it as much as he did to hit that 45 record. I could see it in, in my turntable over and over again. And, um, you know, he was very polite. He was very low key, very, um, very sort of soft spoken and introduced me to his son. And it was very nice. And, and that was the extent of it. But, uh, you know, I'll treasure the fact that I did get to to meet him in person. And he had a hard hard life, as it turned out. And yeah. he found out that was that yeah. weird yes. yeah. secret that came out that his mother was, yeah, let's see. His, yeah, what, what his, the woman that he thought yeah. was his mother was, was, wait, wait. The woman that he thought was his grandmother was really his mother. And, right, that's uh, it. Yeah, that's and what it was. And his mother, the one he thought it was his sister right. was his mother. Yeah, yeah, the one he thought was his sister was... Yeah, I'm I'm just getting all confused now. Yeah, he now. thought the one that he grew up thinking was his sister turned out to be his mother. Yes, yeah. And the one who he thought was, was his, his mother, mother was, was his, his grandmother. grandmother. That's it. Which That's I it. think That's I think the exact same thing happened with Jack Nicholson. Yes, it it did. Did. you're right. I it I read did. that and I was like I couldn't believe the 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 you know the um what do you call it the coincidence or the 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 synchronicity of that that is crazy it is crazy yeah and um, he died very young he had the bad ticker he yeah Bob, 30 37 he died on yeah. the operating table at uh, yeah. he had rheumatic fever as a kid which led to a bad heart and they the doctor d- predicted that he probably wouldn't live past 18 so um he was living with that you know and i think that w- had a lot to do with maybe his sort of um you know uh uh, people looked at him as being pretty aggressive and 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 arrogant and whatever, but I think he felt he was on borrowed time, you know. 
And that and probably, he was. Yeah, he wa- and he was, yeah. Not a bad actor, too, if you see movies. What's the one he made with Poitier? Is it Pressure Point? Pressure Point, he's excellent. And he, yeah, and, he's very good. And he, and he was nominated for an Academy Award in... Um, in in uh, the movie with Gregory Peck and um, oh, and Angie Dickinson, Captain no, Newman, Captain Cap, Newman, Cap, MD. Oh, that's the Captain one where Newman. he gives that whole speech. Yeah, he yeah. plays a war. Where, he's a, he's, a, he's yeah. a, from a Vietnam war vet, and and he's like l- kind of getting losing his mind, and he's great in it. He's really excellent, uh, and and Pressure Point, he was excellent too. Very good actor, underrated. He was yeah. a, he was an under. I mean, and to see him live and listen to his music, I think he's one of the more underrated. Uh, singers of that. I mean, he could swing as good as anybody. Uh, no, I, I think he swing. He could swing better than most of them. I mean, because I saw him, and and if you look at some of his stuff on YouTube, boy, was, he was amazing, just amazing and incredible. I'll tell you a story, and this will t- this will kind of back up my feeling about Bobby, because like I'm, I think he was in, in amazing, and he could sing any genre. You look at him, and that was part of his problem. He could sing, he could sing rock, he could sing folk, he could sing blues, he could sing gospel, and do it great. Yeah, uh, and and do it great. I I had the great privilege of meeting Sammy Davis one time. I went to see him at at a, a show he did in Tahoe, and um, Happy Days was pretty big at the time, so. I was recognized and people found out I was in the audience. So somebody came to me midway through the show and said, Sammy would like you to come to the dressing room afterwards to say hello. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like nervous as hell because I was a big fan of Sammy's too. So I go backstage and, and we're talking and about all, this, all his music and music in general. And then I told him how I was also a huge fan of Bobby's. And he looks at me. And he takes, he doesn't say anything for, and I don't know what he's getting at. And he says to me, the only performer I would not follow is Bobby Darren. Who is Bobby Darren? How about that? Now, was that, wow. that tells you something. He didn't, that, that's the one he said. He, there's a lot of other people he could have said, but he said, yes. he said the one performer I wouldn't follow was, because Bobby was amazing. I mean, I, I saw him live and I'm telling you, he was unbelievable. You see him in those seventies variety shows when he turns up on Flip Wilson and Tom yeah. Jones and all those shows. And he's just electric. And oh. then Darren, no, like, I think right after Kennedy died, he just totally flipped out. Yeah. Um. Yeah, he was a huge supporter of, of 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 Robert Kennedy and became pretty good friends with him, and he got very involved in the campaign, and um, I think it was a combination of when when Kennedy got killed and then when he found out the truth about his personal life, he he kind of became a hermit and he checked out. He moved up to Big Sur, was living in like a trailer, you know, up there, and and was um, and getting into Bob. Dylan's music and and wanting to be, you know, and and giving up the whole nightclub thing and stopped wearing the toupee and, you know, just went through a whole big change. Um, And then, you know, he came back and I remember Steve Blauner, his manager that was played by John Goodman, because I got to know Steve uh, when he saw how much I love Bobby and when we were trying to get the movie made. And he said that uh, Bobby came back because he needed medical care and he, he and he didn't want and it was to get he didn't want to stand in line and so he he came back and became Bobby Darren again you know he gave up because for a while he became Bob Darren like I became Don, <laughs> Don Mose he's a president <laughs> he, he became Bob Darren then he came back as Bobby and uh, you know had sort of a resurgence had his own TV show on for a while and uh, got got picked up and then and then he died um, you know right when they were going to go into another season anyway I'm sorry to bring up. Uh, uh, you know, I no, just it's thought, worth talking about him. He's, you know, we get we get into people like that on this show, and he was. We haven't talked too much about Bobby Darren. He's no, a great, and, just a great and, talent. Yeah, and that's why I think he was um, as successful as he was. I think he was uh, hugely underrated, and who knows what he would have done if you know he had a normal life span. But anyway, there, there was a photo. I think it was Anson Williams sent me. Oh yeah, the photo. And that was a photo, and and he said to us, he goes, look at this. Oh, I know the photo you mean. He said, look at the whole cast and crew and see if anything stands out. Oh, I know the the photo you're talking about. Go Uh, ahead. um, It it happened, it was in the first season of the show. I remember we were shooting what I call the Drag Race episode, um, uh, because I get get challenged by... uh, uh, 
this guy named Skizzy to a drag race. <laughs> and, and, and I remember. <laughs> and, and then, you know, um, and Fonzie's in the car with me, and he realizes that I'm not – probably qualified to do this so he says he says i'll i'll race you and and then that becomes the episode um so i remember we were shooting uh we were rehearsing a scene in in arnold's and and anson went to get some coffee or something at the craft services and he comes back and he says there's a guy over in the corner (laughs) that looks and and i won't say who yet he who looks just like so and so, and we all laugh. Yeah, yeah, right. So and so is really going to come <laughs> to our set, and, <laughs> yeah. and 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 then all of a sudden, the guy walks over with his son, and and it was the guy. It was who exactly who he said it was. John Lennon, and we were like, "Holy cow!" I can't. We couldn't believe it. And with young ha- Julian, with Julian, who was yeah. like nine years old, and they they he was out on a trip to California, taking Julian around. I think they were going to go to Disneyland and. Do and and I think there's a, a a book about him where they talk about this trip, and um and he I guess Julian loved Happy Days so he brought him to the set, and he hung out for like hours and watched us and 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 was talking to the crew and I think Anson told I didn't even know this he would like he was drawing these little doodles on net for the, on napkins and he was giving them to the crew and Anson was like saying we're idiots why didn't we get one of those you know why didn't we get some of his <laughs> <laughs> it's a great photograph. Yeah, it really it is. It really is a great little time capsule. Because just... it is. You have to look at that photograph about yeah. 20 times. Right. You think it's a cast see? member. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jerry Paris is in the picture, too. Yeah, well, yeah. who I love. Jerry was, like, one of my favorite people in the world. As For people who don't know, Jerry was our director for, you know, Gary was our exec producer and creator, but Jerry directed 90% of the episodes. And he also was the director for most of the episodes of the Dick Van Dyke show. And, sure. and, and pl- also the next the next door neighbor. Play Jerry Helper, the next door Jerry. neighbor. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit, we'll talk about Jerry and Gary too, but tell us a little bit about uh, first auditioning. Did you audition for Potsy's part? Yes. Originally? And I bring I this up because it in- indirectly involves one of Gilbert's favorite actors, oh. if I have my story right, and that's Jack Warden. Oh, oh yeah, Jack. Jack is great. That's. I'll tell you a funny story about that too. Um, and then I want to hear how it indirectly, oh my God. God, you, this is unbelievable that you brought this up, Jack Warden. Okay, here's the, here's the deal with that. I, I get a call from my agent to go in uh, you know, for a new series about the 50s, and um, it was for the role of Potsy. So I met several times, and then I had a reading for Gary and a whole you know, room full of people. And then the next thing I heard is um, I'm going to be screen testing. So at the same time, I'm up for a TV movie. That um, I, you know, I I didn't think of myself as a comedian. I thought of myself as an actor that can do comedy if the material is good, you know. But I'm I was never somebody that would get up and, if anything, I was the exact opposite. I was the straight man to all my friends growing up. They were telling jokes, and I would be a good audience for them. And and I was never the guy telling jokes. I was totally opposite the character I played. But. Um, but, you know, they, I, if it was a good part, I, you know, I, I would do it. At the same time, I was up for this TV movie that was a dramatic script written by a guy named Herman Rauker, who had written the movie The Summer of 42, which was like a, one of my favorite movies sure. back then. And it was being directed by a guy named Buzz Kulik, who had directed Brian's Song, which was like the all-time top TV movie. You know, Gail Sayers' story with Brian, I mean, Brian Piccolo and Gail right. Sayers. And James Conn had played Brian Piccolo. So this was a movie written by... The, that guy and directed by the, the, those two people, and it was a really good script, dramatic script, and I was more interested in that. So I went in and read for that, and the director went crazy. He was saying to everybody, D- "Did you see what he did in the room?" He, you know, I knew he loved me. I get home, my agent calls me and says they loved you, and they think you would be perfect because they're, they're, they 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 want to cast Jack Warden as your uncle. As as the uncle in this thing, so and they think you look like a young Jack Warden, which is what later Jerry Paris, who was friends with Jack Warden, always told me that I reminded him of a young Jack Warden. So so they said if Jack does the part, you you you're shoe in for this role, but Jack is overseas doing a film, a war film, and he's not going to be able to give an answer for them for you know for a little while. So we're going to have to wait. So I go in and screen test 
for happy days for Potsy. And then they call me um, on a Friday and said, you didn't get the role, but they want to create this other role for you um, of Ralph. You know, there's a small part, but they're going to build it up. They want you to be a regular. And I said, yeah, but what about that TV movie with Jack Warden? And they go, well, they don't have an answer yet, you know, whether Jack's going to do it. So, but me and my agent and I decided let's hold out and, and pass on Happy Days. So we passed. We, we said, okay, we, 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 we're not going to take the offer because I wanted to do the movie with Jack Warden. So oh, then over the weekend, my agent at the time, a guy named Mark Harris, plays basketball with Gary Marshall. And Gary said, what's going on? You, your boy's turning us down. What, what? And, and he offered my agent a better deal and told him that he thought it had a good chance of going on as a midseason replacement and talked my agent you know, into coming back to me. So he did. And on Monday, he says, I think we should take it. I goes, yeah, but what about the movie, you know, the, the other, <laughs> with Jack? And they go, well, you know, we're not going to know on that for like a week, and they need to know today. So that's when we decided, okay, we'll take Happy Days. And it turns out Jack Warden did do that movie, and I would have gotten to play with, you know. What, what was the Jack Warden movie? It was called originally Forced uh, Remember When. It was a TV movie and a pilot. It was called Remember When, and then I think they changed the title to Four Stars in the in the Window. It was a war, World War II film. Anyway, so that's my Jack Warden, because, you, you know, now how does me getting – not getting Potsy tie into your story about Jack Warden. No, there's no story. It's oh. just that Gilbert worked with Jack Warden, and he's come up a lot on the show. So oh. I thought there was a, there, I thought there was an interesting connection there. He was in all the Problem Child movies. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I never did a scene with him. Oh, but, oh, but that's too bad. He was terrific. Oh, I love. It. He was a great actor. Great actor. I just saw recently the movie, which I've forgotten just how incredible it is. Is all the president's men, and J- Jack is in that. He's great. He was in um, what was that one with Warren Beatty that he was so great? Oh, in? Uh, heaven can, heaven wait. can wait. wait. He's, in the, he's great in the verdict with oh, Paul Newman. And, oh, the verdict. He's wonderful. Twelve Angry Men. Oh, forget about and, it. And <laughs> being there, and the list goes on. Oh, Oh yeah, wonderful, wonderful character actor, and I got to meet him once at a at a, a nightclub, and um, and I think he had had a couple of drinks. <laughs> 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 he was he gets like me when I get very red in the face. We had a similar complexion. <laughs> now you obviously were on one of those episodes of Happy Days. That became a part of the English language now. Yeah. That's, yeah. Can you tell us about that episode? Sure. But I'd also, <laughs> I'd also like to bring up that there's, there's a, my catchphrase that I kind of introduced has become part of the vernacular of, oh, yeah, sure. of, of our society, which was, I still got it. I mean, <laughs> I, said, I, brought, I introduced that. And back in 19, whatever, 75. And the reason, and now people, I hear people using it on TV. I've been going, I still got it. I still, I can't believe that that, because that started with me. And I borrowed or stole that from Jerry Paris. Because Jerry used to, when he would crack a joke and score with a joke around a bunch of people, he'd go, I still got it. You know, like that. <laughs> so then one day I decided I was going to, as Ralph in the show, I, without telling anyone, I was going to steal Jerry's line. And I did it. I used it in the show and it went over big. And then they started writing it in for me all the time. So that was one uh, thing that has caught on in part of our culture. The one that I think you're alluding to is uh, jumping the shark. I, yes. I, sure. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's a... That's, I guess, the other spe- side of the spectrum from I still got it, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, because Fonzie has to jump his motorcycle. No, his, on skis, on his, water skis. Oh, his, his, skis. Water, his, his water skis. His, uh, <laughs> what was it? Like a jet ski? No, no, he was water. Oh, they, was it? They were water skis. Oh, they were water skis. You're right. And he had to go over. There was a te- an area of, in the water where they had a shark. Um, yeah, but... The whole, I guess, meaning of somebody d- determined uh, and used that phrase for uh, when they think a show, a TV show, has, you know, reached its its nadir and and it's now starting to uh, go on the on the decline, so to speak, and it's 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 going downhill. Um, now, for me, 
you know, th- there's two sides of that argument. There, there will be people who will argue, well, the show ran for four more years after that episode, so did it really jump the shark then? Um, but from my own personal point of view, um, I left the show this season afterwards, as did Ron Howard. We left after the seventh season. And it was in my personal opinion that, you know, the episodes, the the scripts, I didn't feel they were as as good as they had been. And it was, uh, you know, I was I was getting a little disappointed and frustrated with with the way that it was going. So maybe I saw that coming. I don't know. But but like I said, some people will argue that, hey, it still was a very successful show for four more years. So. I don't know uh, what the what the verdict is on that. That's for you <laughs> for the audience to decide. Can we ask you about a, a couple of actors on the show and just just quick memories of them? Pin sure. Someone we someone who passed away recently that we never got to was Al Molinaro. Yeah, what a great guy Al was! A sweet, sweet man, just a, 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 a real gentleman, and um, always had a, a, a this great spirit and, and smile on his face and. Um, uh, just a um, lovely, lovely guy, and uh, and a, and a talented comedian. He was he always made you laugh. Great as Murray the cop in The Odd Couple. Oh yes. yeah. yeah. That's, well, Gil, I think, were, were we ticked off that after that in his uh, his obituary, nobody mentioned Murray the cop. Yeah, they just oh. mentioned Al. Oh, he that's was too forgotten bad. about on that show. He was hysterical. He was very yeah. funny in that. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about uh, the late great Pat Morita. Oh man, Pat, I love Pat too. Um, Pat, Pat was a funny, you know, he, he was a funny guy, but then he could be really kind of serious and, and low key. And, um, uh, but, but when he was on, you know, when I, when he would get, when the cameras would be rolling, all of a sudden you'd see a transformation take place with him. And, and, and it was really interesting to see. And I also have a great memory where, uh, I tell this story. Um, he, he he invited me to go to dinner one night before the taping of a show because usually uh, they would provide dinner for us in the commissary, but sometimes we would opt not to go there and to to go. There was a restaurant right outside Paramount Studios called Nicodell's, and it was a nice restaurant with a oh n- sure with I remember n- Nicodell's yes. So that was like a fun place to go. And Pat said, "Hey, do you want to go to dinner and instead of the commissary? We'll go to Nicodell's." So we went there and. And it was great hanging out with him, and and he introduced me to a drink that he I think <laughs> that, that he liked he would like to have before a show, and and um, it's re- so I have to tell everyone because it's a great drink. He would take he would have coffee mixed with sambuca and vodka, and 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 I tried it and it was like whoa that one, that one that one that was a real pick me up. <laughs> It was a good pick me up. So that's how um, the drink that I remember Pat introducing me to. And what about Tom Bosley? Well, and, oh, and Tom introduced me to single malt scotch. And- <laughs> <laughs> I love how these are the memories of these guys. And I'm going to sound uh, <laughs> people. Pe- people are going to think I'm an alcoholic, but um, uh, t- <laughs> t- t- no, Tom and Tom was Tom. Every, I mean, everyone on our show was so we were so lucky. Tom was a great, great guy who became almost, you know, almost like a father to us. Yeah, I remember when we, you know, we were pretty young. So when the show became somewhat successful and we were making money and we were, you know, everyone was saying you should invest and buy a house. And so he he would be giving us advice on real estate and mortgages. And, you know, so he was like a father to all of us when we were going through that. He saw us all getting married and, and buying our homes. And, um, and then I used to love to watch. I remember the very first season. This is a great memory I have of Tom, because um, I remembered his, you know, that he had been a huge star on Broadway, and won the Tony for a, a Fiorello on, mm-hmm. on Broadway. And um, so it was a big kick for me not only to be working with Ron Howard and the funny story about that, which I'll get to later, is uh, uh, remind me of the uh, story with Ron. But here I was working with some great people that that you know their legends preceded them so i would be done for the day because in the beginning we didn't shoot in front of an audience we shot one camera like a like a a movie is so i my scenes yeah i had a small part in the beginning and i'd be done for the day and 
I would, but I would want to go and watch because I knew Tom was working in in the scene with Marion and Ron and and Aaron Moran, and so I wanted to watch because I was like soaking all this in, and I wanted to watch Tom work because it was it was like you know he was such a seasoned pro and his his timing and his delivery and you know the voice he had everything about him it was just you know he was just solid as a rock so I remember. Day after day, I'd be there watching and him turning and finally saying to me, what are you doing? You're done for the day. Go home. <laughs> you know, <and> he's like, <laughs> I, I said, I'd rather stay and watch you, Tom. And that was the truth. I just would stay there for hours watching him work. And uh, that was a, a great now, memory. I, I heard a Tom Bosley story. <laughs> okay. That uh, lay it on was, us. He was hired for some corporate gig. Uh-huh. You know, some big uh, corporation, he'll show up, blah, 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 and, and pose for pictures and sign autographs. And it went on further and further hours of doing this. And then he was sitting down, finally having something to eat. And someone said, oh, uh, Mr. Bosley, can can we have our pictures take with you? And, and he, he was tired at that point. And right. he said, he goes... Not now. I'm off the fucking clock. <laughs> That's heartwarming. <laughs> he kind of blew blew their image for 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 their for, for that, what they had of Tom, I guess, for Mister C, huh? Mister C. <laughs> yeah. Right. I remember people confusing him. I don't know why with the actor David Doyle. Oh yeah, they, I I used to he, confuse because his them. character's name was, was Bosley, Bosley, right? And they yeah. and they had a little bit of a similar kind of a I look. Suppose. They were short and round face. And of course, I remember him in that night gallery episode as the guy who donated in the pilot with that, Joan Crawford that Spielberg oh. directed. Oh He's wow! He's the one who donates his eyes to. Uh, I to never, I, I never saw that episode. I'm going oh, to have to catch that. He's, He's tragic in it. Oh wow! That, that's one of the few. I mean, the pilot episode was the only really good. Night calorie. Oh yeah, yeah. I never yeah. watched that show. I, sh- I guess I, w- I was such a purist for the original Twilight Zones that it was yeah, much better. Yeah, I didn't want to yeah. watch anything else. <laughs> you know, but I'll have to catch that episode for sure. Oh, so I was going to tell you the story with Ron real quickly. Yeah, uh, what was bizarre about me working with Ron ultimately was that when I was say five, six, seven years old, I was almost a sp- you know red hair. I was the same age. I was almost a spitting image of Ron when he was on the Andy Griffith show. So people used to come up to me and call me Opie. And and there were people <laughs> people that literally thought I was him. You know, that and, and then and then it became like my nickname. So you can imagine how surreal it was that now all of a sudden I'm gonna be working with him. It was um and I when I went up to him I think he thought I was nuts too because I was going on and on about that. But we became I, I really that good friends. Thing. I'm sorry? No, I was going to say, I, I, sorry to interrupt, I remember that great gag on Happy Days where they go to the movies and they watch The Music Man. Oh, you right. Remember this? And there's a, there's a reference to how much the boy in the movie looks, looks like, like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Looks like <laughs> Richie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I remember it. there was kind of a reunion of sorts. You did a guest appearance on Charles in Charge. Yeah, I did. With Scott Bayer. I did. That's right. That's great and, that you know and that. You jump ahead of him online when he wants to buy a lottery ticket. Oh, okay. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure I even remember, <laughs> but <laughs> and, and then, uh, of course, by you pushing ahead of him, you get the winning lottery ticket. Oh, okay. That, that's and coming you back. you yell out. Do you remember what you yell out then? No. No. Um, oh. You you yelled out, oh. well, it looks like happy days are here again. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's funny. And I, I, and I just saw Scott recently. We, pl- we played golf together. So <laughs> I'll, I'll tell him that we talked about that episode. He'll Don, we'll kick. move on to the music in a minute. But sure. let's just, just you've worked with, but even before Happy Days, I mean, you had an acting career. You had a long acting career. And, and Gilbert and I are w- remarking at some of the people that you, uh, that you worked with. And I'm hoping you 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 have some memories of because you did a you did a Tom Sawyer movie a Huck Finn movie with with Ron with Ron yeah that was actually about the second or third season into Happy Days. Um, what happened was uh, it was a friend of the, of the Howard's family, Rance being Ron's dad. Uh, there was a guy directing that movie called Robert Totten and Bob Totten and 
and Rance, I think he 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 was he became a bit of a fan of what I was doing. He saw you know the work I was doing, and he recommended me uh, for the film to to Bob Totten. And so it was kind of strange because here we were doing Happy Days, and then all of a sudden we're playing. Tom and Huck together. And and the truth of the matter is almost like we were talking about with Kevin Spacey. Um, we were probably, we were too old to be playing those characters. But they wanted, they didn't want people under 18 because of the hours, the limited hours that, oh, sure. that you work. World. So they wanted people who, actors that would look younger. And we still looked young, but, you know, I was probably 21 at the time. And, Ron, and Ron's almost as old as I am so we were 21 22 so we were really too old to play those characters but it was a great experience um you know and I mean Ron did a good job and and um I had a lot of fun there were some great character actors on that show I think uh Jack, Jack, Elam, Jack Elam was the guy we wanted to ask you about yeah Jack, I I don't think I had I'm trying to remember if I had a scene with him I I don't think so but I remember seeing him on the set and you know, just Merle Haggard was in it. Too. Merle Haggard, yeah, Merle Haggard, and Stymie Beard, which Gilbert would appreciate. Uh, that oh, Stymie from the Little Rascals. St- oh my God! Oh, I don't That's even. Stymie. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, the, the research is too deep. And, yeah. And, and Jack Elam, I always remember being in a very short-lived uh, comedy show. The Texas Wheelers. No, no, he oh. plays. Uh, Fra- the Frankenstein monster. Oh, why right. we brought that up? Oh, really? It, yeah, it's yeah. a terrible show. Oh wow, I didn't know about yeah. that. <laughs> he was also in the Texas Wheelers with uh, Gary Busey. Oh, oh wow, oh. Yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and a young Mark Hamill. Wow. And now I've never heard Henry Winkler say a bad word about anybody. It seems like. Um, now, yeah. So, what are you so trying I'm to get? I'm just saying <laughs> when Scott. No, I, I, I'm saying he called you a scumbag. Oh, really? No. So I'm, no. the, I'm the one exception. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> no, I just can't believe that when Scott Bayo got that big on Happy Days as basically the younger Fonzie, right? That that Henry Winkler couldn't have been a little pissed. You know, I I couldn't speak to that because I wasn't around. Um, I mean, ah. I, I mean, I was around when he first came on the show, um, and and he did. You know, he did ha- uh, generate a lot of uh, attention and got a big following from the young girls. But he was pretty young when he first came on the show. He must have been thirteen or something like that. Um, but you know, when he became even bigger. It was a little bit later when um, they had a spinoff of Joni and Chachi and all that, and I wasn't around during that time. But but w- for the time that he was getting a lot of attention and, and the girls would be yelling in the audience and all that, he was he was incredibly uh, supportive of that. He I, I didn't see him feeling any sense of of you know th- being threatened at all because um, I, I think it was two totally different kinds of. Uh, audiences or whatever you know he got more adult a little more adult uh females interested than the teeny boppers maybe one of the nicest guys i ever met in show business oh yeah henry winkle i have to say tell us about henry oh henry is 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 such a great guy um yeah i remember when i first the first time i met him was um it was like we were in the trailer getting fitted for wardrobe uh, it was the first day of the show of, of the pilot of Happy Days, and and I met him, and 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 I think he was like almost trying to live the character, even though you know we were he he wasn't going to be doing it for another hour or two. I think he was already getting into character because there was this intensity about him, and he seemed so serious. Um, then, as I got to know him later on, I saw what a sweetheart he was. But but you know he was a very serious actor who had gone to the Yale Drama School, you know, for his master's. And so he took the work very seriously, as we all did, and that was one of the things that made it work. But then as I got to know him, he's just, you know, a very warm, generous guy. And we traveled together when they, we did a publicity tour, and they sent the four guys out on this tour. And Ron and Anson traveled, and, and Henry and I traveled together. So we got to be very good friends and really tight. And... um just just a great, really intelligent guy that, uh, you know, um, uh, surprise, continually surprises me with his insight into uh, 
human nature, and, and I think that's what made him so, so good, um, at such a good actor, uh, because he does have such a, a insight into that and a, and a grasp of people, and, and he's so great with people. And and my son and daughter read uh, two of his books. Oh, the Zipper. Yeah, Hank, the Hank, Zipper. Yeah, books. Hank Zipper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, he's he's really into the the books, and and they're doing really well. And he he goes all over the country, you know, uh, signing uh, book signings. And um, I think he even has a series TV series of it in England. And um, I'm actually going to have lunch with Henry on. On Thursday, so um, it'll be great to catch up. I'm really looking give, forward to it. Give him our best. We loved having him on here. I sure will. And we talked about the old movies. You know, the one and only, the the Carl Reiner movie where he was the wrestler. The wrestler, and, uh, yeah, and then and and heroes. Yeah, heroes and the Lords of Flatbush. Oh yeah, Lords of uh, Flatbush. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's versatile. Which which I know the theme song too. Uh, what was the theme <laughs> song? Uh, the, the Lords of Flatbush. Yeah. Hey, hey, what do you say? Looks like it's going to be a very fine day. My girl <laughs> is with me today. Looks like some real fine things are coming my way. Hey, hey, what do you say? Looks like it's going to be a very fine day. Just hanging out with nothing to do. Lucky, lucky me that I bumped into you. Looking so good. Looking so fine. I wonder, 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 should I make you mine? Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> you know every word, every beat. Yes, the it's too much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think Henry was nonplussed when you sang that to him. <laughs> no, but that really was the song? That oh, yeah. was the song. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and... That's, Perry King was in it. Yeah, so uh, and, Sylvester and Stallone. Sylvester sure. Stallone, yeah, sure. And, and Susan Blakely, and uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And you've made a, made a perfect segue. So now we can ask Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> we can ask Donnie about real music, <laughs> <laughs> which which surprises me. I I never heard you sing. Right. But we've both been reading these reviews. Yeah, I did. I, and you've gotten great reviews on your singing. Yeah, I'm really excited about uh, the response. Um, I have been getting great reviews. One just came out from the show I did last week. Um, it was in Cabaret Scene. And um, uh, it was uh, it, it's so it's just so um, I don't even know what the word is. I, I'm left speechless because I started out saying I'm going to do this uh, because I'm um, I have such passion for this music, and I guess because this music, when when I was a, you know in the seventies and eighties, when I was going to high school and then college, and right after that, the music that I loved was not the kind of music that my friends were listening to or that was commercial on the radio. It was you know the rock and the Beatles and and all the stuff that was going on that was fabulous because when you think about it, that period was a renaissance of music where. Uh, uh, rock was being combined with jazz or blues and folk and 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 everything you know from progressive rock to to uh, to um, all kinds of music that that was it was a very creative time and I love that but what was in my heart and soul was the Great American Songbook and 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 and, the, and jazz and that kind of stuff but it was hard to do uh, so when I saw this music coming back into favor with the resurgence of this with artists, Harry Connick started it. And then when Tony Bennett became hot on MTV and then people like, uh, Diana Krall doing it. And of course, Michael Bublé and, and, um, uh, Steve Tyrell. Um, and I, I realized that, Hey, this is the music I love. It's, it's coming back. If there's ever going to be a time, I better do it now. You know, I'm not getting any younger. So I decided about two years ago to put together an act, and and I said, let's see where it goes. And if if people are enjoying it, and I'm having a good time, I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm just I'm doing it for the love of it, and and let's see what happens. And from the get go, people were responding to it in a way that far exceeded my expectations, and and it's gotten better and better and better. I think I've been growing and growing. To the point where, like you, the, the reviews that are coming out, it, you know, it's so nice because it validates what you like to think you're doing, um, but to hear it from people in such, in, you know, with such enthusiasm, um, 
it, it's spurring, it's just spurring me on to want to get better and better and do it more and more. So it, it's great because, uh, you know, as much as, you know, people think, uh, performers like us, we have all this self-confidence and whatnot. I don't know. You still need validation sometimes, you know, of course. and, and, and we all have insecurities and, and, um, and so in, you know, you'd like to think you don't need that, but it, it's certainly nice to have it. So you're going to be at Feinstein's. Feinstein's 54 below. Um, which, in New York. Yeah, in New York City. It's on 54th Street, uh, right between 7th and 8th, right where the old Studio 54 was. It's down below that. That's where, where, where 54 below comes from. It's a beautiful room. Um, I think, I believe it was a, a, several Broadway producers and production designers that kind of put this whole thing together and they did a fabulous job it's just a great experience and it'll be my third time playing there i'm not going to have the full 17 piece band there but i'm gonna have like nine pieces and it's going to be it'll be swinging it'll still swing and uh i i can't wait to to come back to new york and you know it's always great to come back and, and, and if, and if Gilbert and I come to see you, of course, you'll invite him up for an encore. After, after. <laughs> I think we should do a duet. Yeah. <laughs> I want to do I want to do the, the song from Lords of Flatbush with you. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm going I'm to have to start, what you I'm gonna start for, boning up on that. <laughs> and, and can I say I like Sinatra, too, but I really prefer Kiki D. Oh, <laughs> Kiki D. Yeah. Where did you pull I, that out of? I remember. I used to like Kiki D. Didn't Kiki she sing with, with Elton John? Didn't she sure, sing? She, oh, was, yes. she was on his record label. <laughs> yeah. On Rocket Records. Yeah. And, she, she and was good. she's bigger than ever. I got the music in me. Now, that, one was, thing, that was a good song. I like that. Bet. One thing we have in common is both of us have popped up on Family Guy. Oh right, yeah. I'm, how did how did you pop up? I I I'd love to hear uh, your story. I was uh, Peter and the family go out west, and he's rescued from being lynched by a horse, <laughs> and, and I'm the horse. Uh, oh, you're the horse. You are. <laughs> oh wow. Oh cool. I have to see that one. That sounds like an entertaining yeah, episode. Like he thanks the horse. The horse goes, "No problem, Peter," and Peter goes, "Wow." Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Is it on YouTube? I, I probably could find oh, I'm, it. I'm sure, yeah. I'm going to look for that. And mine was a one where they had some fun with what we talked about earlier, about my name, my name change. So so there was this episode where they're – I forget the characters' names because I, I – but they're walking along in the woods somewhere, and one of them says, oh, you know where this is? This is the spot – where once every, I don't know how many years, um, Donnie most rises from the the mist or something like this. <laughs> and, so bizarre. Uh, yeah, and, and then all of a sudden there's this song that they created, which is f- really fun with these great harmonies. Uh, 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 it's called Donnie most, Donnie most. And it goes on. And then you see my character start rising from the mist. And then at the very end, and they have this big crescendo. And then I go... It's Don Most now. And then and then they go, Don Most, and then I go back down. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a Brigadoon. Yes, it's a Brigadoon uh, moment. A send-up. Yes, that's what it is, a Brigadoon send-up. Right. But I can't tell you how many people have written to me about that, How but they got a kick out of that. They what an it. honor. Yeah. And... and, and- Yes. Can you sing a song for us now? No, I can't. I, I really can't. <laughs> I wish I could, but... Even even if I did a duet with you? <laughs> I, I, I'll invite you, if you come to 54 Below, okay. we'll, we'll do it then. <laughs> what is you the date? June 2nd. June Let's 2nd. say it again. June, June 2nd at Feinstein's 54 Below, the old Studio 54. Yes. and Because if, if we get the words to, like... Saying something stupid like I love you. Could we sing that together? Yeah. Yeah. If you guys do something stupid, <laughs> play wet. So I have to so, we'll record it for the show. So, But you'll have to let me know if you're really coming because I'm going to have to let my band know to be ready for <laughs> To let that to be ready for that. <laughs> Are you in town on June second? We'll have to check with. Yeah. We'll have to check with Dad. We'll have great. to check his touring schedule. It'd be great if you came down. That would be a hoot. And and I would definitely have you up. We will do that. Well, I'm Gilbert Godfrey. This has been Gilbert Godfrey's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. 
once again recorded at Nutmeg Post with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. And judging on what he's doing at the time, acting, singing, or just staying at home, uh, we have been talking to either Donald Most, <laughs> right. Donnie Most, Don or Most. Don Most. Or, 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 D- or D Most. <laughs> or D Most. Or D Most. <laughs> Weren't you Don Most with two N's at some point, too, in the old days? Yeah, there was one film I tried that, too. I tried that. Oh. <laughs> that was... That was that. Yeah, I tried the O N N. That was Crazy Mama with Cloris Leachman and directed by Jonathan Demme. Jonathan Demme. Um, Before Jonathan you run Demme. away, tell us a, tell us one little memory because that's got a great cast. Oh Stuart yeah, Stuart Whitman Stuart, and, and Anne Southern and, and, and Anne, the great Anne Southern who was the voice in the of what Gilbert? She was the my mother. Oh, right. My mother. My mother, the car. Yes. There you go. Oh, my yes. God. And Southern. We, we spoke to Dick Van Dyke about it because his brother, right. Jerry, was Oh, the that's star. right. He was the star of that. And yeah. Ann Southern, and Ann Southern, I think, also, wasn't she in Topper? Remember the show Topper? Oh, I, I oh think wow. She might have been. Was she? She might have been. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm mixing her up, but was she, that, that was a Roger Corman movie, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, Crazy, Crazy Mama? Mama. Yeah, he he Jonathan produced Demi. it, and Jonathan Demi, uh, yeah, Roger Corman and his wife Julie Corman produced that, and Jonathan Demi directed it. Oh, I, I had a great. That was my introduction. That was Crazy Mama. Was that the one which uh, Shelley went to? No, that, that was, was that was a different. That, that was a different. That was like a uh, different Mama. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, that, yeah, they, that might have been Bloody Mama, Bloody Mama, or something yeah. like with that. Shelley Winters and 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 Robert De Niro. I think so. an he, unknown Robert De Niro. Yeah, maybe Jonathan Cap. They were they were both Corman pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were. I'm pretty sure they were. But uh, that was my introduction to independent films, and which I loved because you know here I was working uh, for 18 days on a film, and we were all. And it was a bit of a road movie, so but we were all together, and and Jonathan was great in terms of bringing the cast in and and getting their contributions, and and then you know having Clor- Cloris, who was an amazing talent, she had just won the Academy Award for the for the last picture show. Sure. This was like a year or two after that, and then and so seeing her at work and and working with her on scenes and and Anne Southern and and Stuart Whitman, it, w- it was and and watching Jonathan direct. What a great introduction for me to independent filmmaking, which is still my favorite. You know, I prefer, um, I, I, I like doing indie films um, for that reason, you know, the collaboration and, and the, a little more freedom than you would have in a studio film. And um, Future Oscar winner, Jonathan Demme for Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, Silence of the yeah. Lambs. Yeah, he's yeah. He amazing. He's done amazing work. So, And when I worked with him, it was his second film. And uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, and I, I did a. I've done a. Recently, I've done an independent film called Follow, which is a psychological thriller. So it was a different kind of role, and I really enjoyed that. And I think that's going to be released in, in theaters. Uh, in um, gosh, I'm not sure. In, maybe in, the, in September. You know, okay. something like that. September, October. Called Follow, and uh, so, and I'm working so fo- on some others as well. To hopefully to direct. And get going because uh, I've directed th- three now, three of my own indie films. Okay, so follow. Yes, and and Feinstein's. Yes, yeah, fifty four below. 50, a lot of F's going on there. And and once again, we have been talking to four guests on <laughs> today's show. That's right. We have been speaking to Donald Most, <laughs> Donny Most, Don Most. And demos. And demos. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. And you've heard of the th- you've heard of the three faces of Eve. So this is. The- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks for doing it. Oh, uh, thanks. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having it's me. A treat for us. Thank my. We'll turn. see you at Feinstein's. I hope you make it and let me know, and then I'll get the band ready. Okay, buddy. <laughs> okay. Bye, bye.